Uh, well, hello everyone. Uh, this uh, lecture will be held in English and uh, you are all very welcome to Värt att veta, Worth Knowing, the lecture series that presents important research findings in a way that we can all understand. The series Worth Knowing is organized by the SLU Library. My name is Karin Benmarker and I will host this seminar today together with Lucia Hatamian and Jennifer uh, Salomonsson from the library. Uh, you will be able to ask questions after the lecture uh, in the chat or by raising your hand. Please keep your microphones on mute as the lecture will be recorded. The recording will be, uh, of the lecture will be published on the Worth Knowing website later. So today we are hosting Eva Forsgren uh, from the Department of Ecology, who will talk about the truths and myths about bee deaths. Eva has a Master of Science in Biomedical Laboratory Science from Uppsala University, and she has a PhD in Biology from SLU. Eva is a part of the Honeybee Research Group at SLU, uh, which is internationally renowned for its work on honeybee pathology, especially uh, microsporidia, bacterial diseases, parasitic mites, and viruses. So that's a very short introduction about you, Eva. And now we are very eager to hear more about the truths, truths and uh, myths about B deaths. Oh, that was very difficult to say. Anyway, welcome, Eva. I hand <laughs> over to you then. <laughs> Thank you, Karin. Yeah, it, it is very difficult to pronounce the title of my presentation. I'm going to start to share my screen. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about this. You can read it yourselves. I'm not going to try to pronounce it again. Um, um, yes, and I've been asked to hold this presentation in English, and I'm going to do my best to do that. Um, however, uh, quite a few of these uh, headlines uh, I have to present here is in, uh, are in Swedish, but I guess you will understand the message here. It's about bee death. Uh, a few years ago, it was like really a hype, I would say, that a lot of newspapers were announcing that all the bees are dying, more or less. Um, and uh, that is what I'm going to talk about today. What are the facts behind this, um, this uh, um, alarming headlines that we saw a few years ago? Uh, I guess you have heard this. Uh, it has been claimed that Einstein said, if the bee disappeared on the face of the earth, man would only have four years left to live. But I have to say that that is probably not true. It would be very remarkable if he said those words. He was not even working like in, bio, in the field of biology. And you have to bear in mind that this is not an uncommon way to say things that you want to spread around, that you, you, you put it in the mouth, so to speak, of a really well-known person, and preferably a person that has been dead for many years uh, and cannot say that I've never said this. Um, so this is a myth. And by the way, is this true? Would we die uh, if the bees disappeared? Uh, so to understand that, we have to talk a little bit about the importance of insect pollination for food production. So insects pollinate about 90% of the Earth's total flora and 35% of our crops, the things that we grow to produce food. Uh, and about 75% of these crops are dependent on pollinators to some extent, it varies a bit. But these crops account for only one third of the global production, which means that many of our staples like corn, rice, uh, and so on are independent of pollinators. So we would not starve. We would have things to eat. 
Uh, and I will come back to the, the, that in next slide, but some more numbers because I, I talk about pollination uh, and that can be performed by other animals such as flies and wasps and, and so forth and so on. But the bees account for as much as 70% about that pollination. And there has been ways, I mean, it's really difficult to estimate, of course, the, the, the value, but it has been they have tried to estimate it and it's been estimated at $577 billion per year, which means that the honeybee is actually in third place when it comes to animals used in, 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 in like food production. Of course, we have the, the cattle, uh, whatever that's called, in, and, and the pig meat, but then you have the honeybee actually in third place if you, if you look at the economic value, which is quite impressive actually. Well, so you understand we will still still have our staples if the bees disappear, but uh, as you can see from this picture, for example, I would, I mean, if I couldn't have my coffee several times a day, I mean, what life would that be? Um, and if you look at this picture, the, the breakfast you had this morning might have looked, uh, as you see, to the left here, but without the bees, you would have been... Um, yeah, you would have been presented with the breakfast that you see on the picture to the right. Uh, and another way to illustrate it is what the uh, um, Whole Foods, uh, which is a, how do you say, Livsmedelskedja, well, it's, a, it's the store in, in the United States. They try to illustrate it this way. Uh, and you can see that your product choices without the bees is much less, much grayer. I would say, because a lot of the things that we eat uh, that are colorful, like berries and fruits, uh, we would have to do without, without the bees. So of course, the bees are super duper important. But one of the things that have been confusing in all these uh, headlines and all these uh, discussions about the bee deaths is the confusion between the European honeybee, Apis mellifera, that is used in beekeeping all over the world, and other bees, I would say. And other bees, that's not a few bees, because there are about 20,000 species of bees all over the world. And some of them are really specialized. For example, they have co-evolved with one specific uh, plant. Um, and so if that plant, plant disappears, the bee disappears and vice versa. Um, but when we talk about the situation for bees on our planet, it's very different when you talk about uh, the honeybees that we have, that we use in apiculture and other wild bees. And that's important to keep in mind. Um, in Sweden, we have approximately 300 species of wild bees and about 40 of those are bumblebees because bumblebees are also bees. Uh, and it's much easier to understand that when you speak English than when you speak Swedish. Um, and I mean, if you look all over the world, of course, the situation for, for the native bees are different, but let's stick to Sweden now and talk about the situation for the wild bees. One third of our wild bees in Sweden are red listed, meaning that they are, they are threatened in some way. You, uh, yeah, and, and their habitats are sh shrinking or other things. And research has shown, research from Lund University has shown that this is mainly due to changes in land use, uh, decrease in pasture, because pasture, that uh, landscape where you have, um, where you have the cattle uh, grazing is very important for a lot of species of wild bees. So that is considered to be the most important negative factor for red listed bees in Sweden. And here you have a number of other things that are reasons for declines uh, in wild bees. I also I discussed the loss of habitat and isolated remaining habitats and separation of resource, resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also competition with honeybees actually that has become uh, sort of a hot topic, especially in our neighbor country uh, Denmark, where they don't have a lot of. I mean, they don't have a lot of land, <laughs> let's face it. And there's been a, a, 
there's almost, I would say, not well, that polarization between beekeepers and and uh, people that say that the honeybees are competing uh, with the wild bees. There, there's much to be said about that, but I'm not going into that in this uh, presentation. So, um, so the threats to uh, let's just go back for a while. The the threats to I mean, some species of wild bees are really threatened. I mean, they are dying. Uh, that's a fact. But uh, if we look at the, at the European honeybee, Apis mellifera, uh, that is used, as I said, in apiculture around the globe, what's happening, in, what's happening with, with them? Well, it depends on what time perspective you have. If you look at this picture that I'm showing you from the 19, this is from US from 1945 to 2005, uh, the number of honeybee colonies decreased from six and a half million to about two and a half million. And the picture is the same if you look at Europe. Uh, this has to do with, this has to do with socioeconomic um, um, things. Uh, that's the background. Uh, I mean, different perspectives on, on uh, not having to produce your own sugar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and the same thing is true during this period in Sweden, I think we lost, I mean, I think the number of honeybee colonies may be declined by, I don't know, 50%, but a lot uh, less. But if you extend that picture, uh, and you look at the same uh, the same picture, but you add on a few years after 2005, you can see that it sort of stabilizes in the US. Uh, it's about two and a half million colonies. And I just checked because this is a, a bit old picture, but I just checked that in 2021, they had 2.66 million colonies uh, estimated in, in the US. So, um, um, so you cannot say, say that it's been a decline in honeybee colonies uh, over the last uh, decades. But this interesting report shows, uh, 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 points at a, a few interesting things that the number of honey, honeybee colonies actually increased. Uh, if, if you look worldwide, if you, if you look at a globe around the globe with between 45% uh, between 61 and 2009. But, and here's the but, during that period, the agricultural demand for pollination, pollination increased with 300%. And uh, in recent decades, there's also been an increase in colony losses in some parts of the world. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about the difference between colony decline and colony losses. We're talking about honeybees now, because here is also a confusion. So we can all agree on that there are proof that the number of honeybee colonies worldwide have increased and are still increasing, or at least they are not declining. And how can that be? I mean, if, if you say there have been so many losses or big losses, why, why aren't the number of colonies declining? Well, for those of you who are not beekeepers, I will try to explain this. Let's say you have a beekeeper and he has four hives. Uh, and during winter, um, two of them die. They don't survive. Then he has a 50% winter loss. That's a lot. Uh, <laughs> but the following autumn, this beekeeper might have four colonies still or maybe even six or more. And that is because you have, if you have a honeybee colony or honeybees have a reproduction on colony level, I mean, of course, the, the honeybees reprodu reproduce on individual level. You have the queen lay eggs and then you have more and more individuals, but you can see, you can uh, look upon a honeybee colony as a super organism and as that, that organism has to have a reproduction mode on colony level as well. 
Uh, so in nature, that happens when the colony uh, um, gets a new vir virgin queen and the old queen takes half of the colony and, and flies away to, to a new um, um, hollow wood or whatever, so somewhere to live. And that is the rep natural reproduction. But this is something that the beekeepers can do themselves. They can make splits. Out of one colony, they can make two colonies. Um, they buy a new queen or they, they produce their own queens and from one colony they get two. Um, so this is how beekeepers, uh, this is how beekeeping works, I, I would say. And that, of course, then explains that colony losses, even if you have 50% colony losses, you still, you can still be able to, to, to replace those colonies. Uh, this is a graph showing estimated colony losses in the US uh, over a, a certain time period. And I, I don't know if you can see that uh, very well, but you can see that uh, uh, the, the dark orange is the total annual loss because you can also, of course, calculate how many colonies you lose over the whole year. Uh, the yellow is total winter loss because here in the northern parts of, of the world, um, the winter is when the honeybee colonies are more likely to die. Whereas in the more warmer climates, that might be during the summer when there is uh, uh, not enough rain and not, a, not uh, enough flora resources. So it's different, but, but this, is, this is North America. So uh, they are interested in winter losses. And the uh, gray one is, they ask the beekeepers, what is for you an acceptable winter loss? And you can see that gray, for, for the beekeepers in the US, it seems like 15 to 20% losses is acceptable, but they end up with having winter losses on about 30%. And that's been like that for, for, for decades now, actually. Uh, and uh, I mean, I would like to talk to the, uh, if, if you look about, if you talk about farmers that have pigs, for example, I mean, a 30% loss of pigs is not acceptable. So it's a lot. So what is the situation in Sweden? Well, we have a quite a, a long record uh, from the beginnings of, of the 1900s of winter losses in Sweden. And, but if, if, you, um, if you put them together into decades like, like this, like Preben, my colleague, has done. And you can see that the last uh, blue bar, you actually have uh, an increase in, in losses during that decade. Um, so that is true even for uh, us in Sweden, that we have an increase in colony losses. But let's go back, let's go back to the US. This is a, a picture where Lisa Simpson asks, why are the bees dying? And indeed, why are the bees dying then? As with so many other things, there is not one single reason for this. There are many, uh, I think, most researchers, if not all, are quite uh, in agreement that you have to have a holistic view on this. There are so many things that interact and drive colony losses. Uh, the things that we work with in our group, diseases, pests and parasites, uh, monocultures, uh, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide, pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, um, a flower poor landscape, and not at least actually management. And with management, I mean beekeeping practices. Um, beekeepers not taking care of their animals in a, a, a proper way, I would say. Yeah, this is what a, a, a cornfield in the US can look like. And this is, of course, a desert for bees. There is nothing for them there. Um, and the monocultures, I mean, after World War II, our agricultural landscape has, 
has changed a lot because we have to be able to produce enough food for our growing uh, for for the growing human population and and that's why it has been intensified the way it has been and that of course is uh, has a lot of uh, negative results too and even a place like this uh, this is the central valley in california uh, during the almond blossom i've actually been there myself and it's quite amazing it, it's it, the almonds bloom uh, a short period uh, in late January and February, like six weeks. And two thirds of the whole, um, all the colonies in the US are shipped to the Central Valley in California to pollinate these almonds during the blossom. And this is a picture I took when I was there. You can see that they have uh, a lot of hives and they are sort of stacked on top of each other. Um, uh, and they bring them there to pollinate the almonds. I think that the, the world production of almonds, I think like 80, somewhere between 80 and 90% uh, are produced in, in, in California. So this is a, um, yeah, this is a very important task for our honeybees. Uh, the rest of the year, there's no, almost nothing for them to, to get there and they cannot, uh, there are not many, um, uh, wild bees around either. So th this is what it looks like uh, when they ship all these colonies uh, from well the east coast to the west coast of the US and then they they can well some of these migratory beekeepers are on the road most of uh, most of the year and and bring their colonies to to pollinate different um, different crops like blueberries in Maine or uh, watermelons uh, somewhere in the south and well that's when you start to think, hmm, that cannot be good. That cannot be good. That must be a factor that has an, an impact on uh, and leading to, to co uh, colony losses. But in fact, no. And that's quite surprising. This graph shows um, a, a study that was, or a survey that was made covering three years in the US, uh, somewhere in the mid, to, I think it was maybe 2012, something like that. Um, and you can see that the migratory beekeepers actually lost fewer colonies, significantly fewer colonies than the non-migratory non or stationary beekeepers did. Uh, and that's kind of contraintuitive, I would say. Uh, and we also have a, a a similar result from, from, from a survey that was done in, in, Europe, in Europe in 2012 to 14, where the commercial migratory beekeepers had, lo had the lowest losses of all, uh, uh, all the beekeepers in, in this survey. Um, and where actually a very interesting thing, well, uh, the main factors that were correlated to high colony losses were high levels of varroa, and I will come back to that. That is a mite, a parasitic mite that I will talk about uh, uh, in, in a few minutes. But I'm very interested to, to see, or I was very interested to see that not having participated in any beekeeping related training or education for the last three years had a big negative impact on the survival of the honeybee colonies. And that's why I'm saying that the management is super important when it comes to honeybees. Um, you have the responsibility as a, a beekeeper to take care of your proper care of your bees. Okay. Last but not least, I'm going to introduce you to the Varroa mite with a proper name, a mite with a proper name, Varroa destructor. Um, it's an ugly creature, as you can see in this picture. Uh, this mite is um, its original host used to be the Asian honeybee, uh, Apis, uh, Apis serrana in Asia, the Asian honeybee. But 
because Apis mellifera, the European honeybee, was brought, of course, also to Asia, because there you have beekeeping side by side by both these species, uh, the eastern honeybee and the western honeybee. So the mite jumped host from the, from the Asian bee to Apis mellifera. The Asian bee and the varroa mite has co-evolved over a long period of time so that the mite doesn't really have a, a very strong negative impact on the Asian bee. But on our European bee, Apis mellifera, it has. It's a parasitic mite that, uh, that um, uh, parasitizes on the honeybee brood uh, mainly. And it has really strong mouth parts and it pricks holes on the uh, larvae and pupa and, 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 and suck the body fluids, uh, mainly from the fat body uh, of the bee. It can also survive on the adult bees where it sort of, uh, it sticks between the, the segments on the back of the bee. Um, so it can survive the winters here when, when the bees don't have any brood. Um, the thing with this uh, uh, mite is that it's actually not the mite that kills the honeybees. It's the viruses that they transmit because the varroa mite is a biological vector for viruses and mainly a virus called deformed wing virus. And you can see that on the, the bottom picture here where you can see that this newly emerged, newly hatched bees has wings that are deformed. Um, yeah, and that's like the main reason behind why, why the, colonies, uh, uh, the colonies die. The virus weakens the bees in the colony. Uh, and this is actually uh, my last slide, and that is to uh, say something about um, a very big part of the research that is performed within the Honeybee uh, Research Group uh, at SLU. Um, I said that the Asian honeybee has co-evolved with the Varroa mite, so um, so they can coexist. Uh, so my, my former colleague and uh, um, uh, Professor Ingemar Fries started an experiment on the Baltic Isle of Gotland because the hypothesis was that also Apis mellifera, the Western honeybee, if left alone uh, with the mite, uh, without treatment, because colonists generally don't survive if you don't treat uh, and get rid of the, the mite. But he left, uh, he said like 150 colonies on the southern part of Gotland, and to each colony he added 50 mites, and then he just left them standing there to see what happened. And almost all of the colonies, of course, died, but like a handful survived and has, to make a long story short, and they have, have evolved some traits that makes them, uh, makes them uh, more resistant uh, to the Varroa mite. Um, and this was in the late 1990s. And since then, we have done research on these so-called survival population. There are all, also a few other survival populations of honeybees out in the world, uh, that's, uh, but they are more, uh, they didn't come about because it was a controlled experiment. They have more or less been like, you know, left alone in a wood or something somewhere in Norway or <laughs> some island somewhere. Uh, but, but on all of these survival populations, there are research being done to try to find out the traits or the mechanisms behind uh, this resistance. The tricky thing though here is that it seems like these populations have different traits or different mechanisms to, uh, to handle the Varroa mite infestation. And this is very, very intriguing and very interesting to look at. And, and what is ongoing in our group right now is that we look at all these things 
uh, all these factors in combination with the sort of survival populations. Uh, how are these traits? Are they um, transferred genetically to the next generation? Yes, they are. Uh, we are looking at varroa associated virus infections, which ones, uh, uh, and we can see, for example, that these bees are not only tolerant to varroa mite, they also tolerant, more tolerant to virus infections. We look at genetics, uh, new methods to look at, at genetics. Honeybee specific substances, is there anything uh, chemical that these um, uh, parasitized uh, larvae, ex what do you say, exude here? Exude, I think the word is. We look at the microbiome. Is there a difference in the microbiome? Immune defense on both individual level and colony level, and also look uh, at some factors um, into breeding. If there's something, some traits that can actually be better uh, for uh, for breeding, but are resistant bees, because and this is my uh, my last uh, message. I would say. Right now, the only way to deal with the varroa mite infestations in honeybee colonies is for the beekeeper to treat and try to, to keep uh, the mite levels on uh, low levels because that also keeps the virus levels down. But in the end, what every beekeeper and every researcher too, I would say, would, would like to have is to like to, um, to have the same situation as we have with the Asian honeybee, that Apis mellifera, uh, that we will have uh, 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 populations of Apis mellifera that are resistant uh, against uh, the mite. Um, yeah, that was, that was my last slide. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Eva. That was super interesting to hear about. Uh, I just have a question uh, direct, directly. Do you think mm -hmm. that um, the, the climate, I mean, if we get the warmer climate, um, uh, will that have an impact on the winter loss of the colony? Uh, or is it not a matter of temperature? Well, well, yeah, of course. I mean, I mean, harder, tougher winters are, of course, also uh, harder on 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 the bees, uh, of course. Uh, and I mean, if you look at the native the native Apis mellifera in Sweden, um, we probably don't have those native populations anymore. But they used to be only to Mälardalen, the spread, the natural mm -hmm. spread. And then the beekeepers took them further north. But I do think, I, I don't know that, this is just speculation, but I, I, would, I would guess that as for other insects that um, uh, limit <laughs> as, as um, extended north. So I'm sure it has some impact, but I can't say, I mean, more than that. I see. Well, thank you. Uh, if any of the uh, audience would like to, to either raise a hand or write a, a question in the chat, that you know, please do so. Um, we have one question, uh, and then that is, can we reproduce crossbreed uh, or crossbreed the bees from different countries together for them to trans transmit that resist resistant gene? Mm. develop a new bee <laughs> yeah well not not between the species no uh, i mean there are hybrids of apis mellifera of, of of course or of course of course but there there, there are uh, hybrids between them uh, so forth and so on but but to crossbreed uh, apis serana with apis mellifera no no okay and then we have um, uh, who has a question as well, please? Yes, I'd like to hear, is it, I'm coming back to these, uh, uh, the previous question actually, then we can look, is it possible to genetically manipulate uh, bees to achieve the resistance to varroa crawls, to in introduce, let's say, the genetic variant that the already resistant animals have? And how much is it, how much science, how much research is done in this area, in this question? 
uh, well, aspect. Yeah. Well, there has been research done, of course, of course, uh, researchers are, are always looking for genetic markers for specific traits in, in the different populations uh, of the bees, uh, of course. The, the tricky thing here is that it's not one, one trait and one loci in, 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 in the genetics. That, that's not how it works. So that is like really, really, really difficult uh, to do, I would say. But there is ongoing research. research uh, uh, but I would be very, very, <laughs> very afraid to uh, talk about genetically modified honeybees. Okay, thank you. No, this I can I can I continue? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I can understand that. It's I mean, the still the genetically modified issue is uh, very sensitive. Can I turn uh, attention to another matter, and that is neonicotinoids, I mean, the type of pesticides, yes. which have been very much discussed in relation to bees. Yes. And you have hardly mentioned this in your presentation here. And if you try to sort of grade uh, different threats to bee populations today, where would you put pesticides in relation to Varroa qualster and also other diseases that affect bees, particularly the diseases that are introduced from other continents, like, in, like invasive species? Yeah, 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 I understand the question. Well, specifically neonicotinoids, I mean, they are now banned, so, uh, but um, I mean, for the agrochemicals or the chemicals that are, are, are used, um, the model organism for doses uh, that the, the companies have are honeybees. So they know quite well, uh, like the lethal doses and, and, and for honeybees. But the problem here is that it's not the honeybees that are uh, most vul vulnerable. Uh, we are, have been involved in, are still involved in, in, uh, in projects also on chemicals. Uh, uh, and it, it's the solitary bees, the bumblebees that are, are more, uh, much more affected than, than the honeybees. Because if you look at a honeybee colony, you have ten, tens of thousands of individuals. So you have a, um, a more robust um, organism if you look at a colony than you have. So uh, I would not actually grade uh, the chemical use as, of course, I can't say that it, it's not a threat, but not, not very high for, for honeybees actually, no, especially not in Sweden. I see. Well, thank you. We have a couple of more questions. Do Asian bees get the deformed wing virus, can you say that the bees are resistant to varroa? Is it that they can handle them? I mean, the resistance and tolerance, uh, I mean, resistance is when you are, when the host is actually making, um, uh, how should I put this in English, making it more difficult for the parasite to reproduce. I mean, you get a reduction in reproduction, I would say. And tolerance is that you can tolerate the, the pathogen or a parasite without affecting the parasite. Mm. Um, uh, so that was the, oh yeah, uh, Apis serana. And well, you can talk about resistance because the, the, the uh, uh, Varroa mite, uh, Apis serana has ways uh, to reduce uh, the reproduction, uh, the Varroa reproduction. Uh, and the other question about regarding the foreign wing virus, well, the thing is that uh, the foreign wing virus has been around, it seems like, uh, forever, irrespective of uh, the varroa mite. Uh, but if we talk about Apis mellifera, the Western honeybee, um, before the mite was introduced, the, the honeybees could most of the time handle the deformed being virus because the spread is not very effective uh, because then you have an oral transmission. Uh, but since you have the mite as a, an actor in this play, uh, you have a vector and you can, you can, 
I mean, you can imagine when you have the mite that has the virus in its mouth parts and, and bites a hole into the bee to suck their body fluids, that of course, that is a very, very effective way for the virus to spread. Um, yeah, I don't know if that was answered to your question. I hope so. <laughs> well, we'll see. Uh, we have a couple of more questions. And um, one is speaking of the importance of management when it comes to bee survival, does SLU have plans to offer targeted training to beekeepers? Uh, absolutely, but we are involved in a lot of Samverkans project um, with, with big. Uh, the beekeeping organizations in Sweden and we are also in the beginning of I don't know but this is a project that that aims at us being some sort of a hub with a undervisningsbegård uh, education apiary and, and so forth and so on and we will see what what, what will happen? But we are already involved. I mean, we are involved in the education of the bee inspectors and uh, and, and also uh, yeah, we have we have uh, beekeepers visiting and 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 uh, and so forth and so on. So, but in a more structured way, I guess you mean. Yeah, I think we might. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks, Paul. Uh, okay, so the question is if uh, beehives are put in close proximity to each other, if if the likelihood of disease spread is higher? And the simple answer is yes. I have, uh, I wanna tell you about something a colleague of mine in the US said, uh, because the migratory beekeepers in general, a lot of them after the season is done, they take all their uh, honeybee colonies and they put them in apiers down in Florida to stay for, for, I don't know, a couple of months be, be, before, before the season starts again. And um, I mean, you have tens of thousands of honeybee colonies uh, standing like very, very close. And he said that, oh, this is really a brothel for diseases. So um, of course, if you have a very high density of uh, bee colonies in an area, the likelihood of spreading diseases is, is, is much, much higher. And it has also been shown actually that, um, that managed honeybees can spread diseases to wild bees. Uh, for example, if a few virus diseases uh, is, is connected to that. So of course, yes. We have one last question as well, and it's, um, is it a danger to treat the honeybees against varroa too much on an unnecessarily oxalsyra, myrsyra, etc. if we want uh, them to develop resistance, resistance themselves? Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, yeah. T to treat for varroa mite, you have, you have chemicals like uh, products that you can buy uh, with active ingredients like fluvalinate, etc. But uh, what you're asking about is the organic acids that we actually uh, recommend that you use, uh, mysyr mm. uh, and oxal And one of, the, uh, one of the reasons that that we recommend that is that you can you haven't we haven't seen any resistance in the varroa mite towards the organic acids. Uh, but you can see that uh, in uh, the commercially available uh, chemicals. Uh, anyways, no, I mean, you should not treat, I mean, unnecessary treatment is never good. Uh, I mean, you should have a, you should check. I mean, you should go and look what, how are the levels of raw mite in my colonies? And then you should treat, you, you should make a, a judgment on whether you need to treat and when and how and so forth. There are, uh, I'm not a specialist in the, in the treatments uh, in a more practical way, but there are, uh, uh, there are others. E-hälsoconsulenten, till exempel. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have another very, very, very short question then. I, I, I like just to come back to what we talked about neonicotinides neonic and what you said about wild bees. 
if you look on the total pollination capacity, uh, we can say, how much are the tame, are the domesticized bees representing the pollination capacity in comparison to the natural ones? I mean, how big in, proportion is the domes domesticated? In Sweden, you mean? In Sweden, yeah, of course. We can take even in Uppsala. Yeah, because that, of course, I, I, now I'm guessing because I don't have any numbers, at least I'm not aware of numbers. Uh, um, I think it varies also within Sweden, of course, depending on, of course. on what, 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 uh, what a landscape looks like. Yeah. Uh, but I would, I mean, I, I think that uh, <laughs> we are not dependent on honeybees for, for pollination of our apples or well yeah in Skåne they are maybe in the or apple orchards but uh, yeah I don't know I don't know if anyone really knows but I would suspect that a lot of the pollination that we see in our our uh, backyards are done by uh, wild bees. But isn't that a very important question to try to work a bit more on them because also coming back to what you said about sensitivity to different pesticides and that Absolutely. the wild ones may be more sensitive and and then we are again doing something that perhaps is not the best Absolutely I agree completely and I mean it, it, as the situation is in the US for example with the almonds uh, that I talked about I mean to be so dependent upon upon one species uh, I don't think that is wise at all. So mm -hmm. I agree. Okay. Yeah, and the, uh, the almond culture is also very artificial in a way that is very, very concentrated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. I actually managed to find uh, one of these. Did you know that? It's a bee hotel in okay. my room. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I have a bee wax. Uh, here for my sandwich, so uh, we we need okay. a lot. Anyway, but thank you all very very much for uh, attending and everyone for um, asking interesting questions as well. And uh, I would just like to say, please join us uh, on the next Worth Knowing uh, that is organized by the Umeå Vätatveta Committee. And then Navinder Singh will talk about making space for biodiversity in a society focused on climate change. And that will be online and it'll be in English. So please join us on that one uh, in a couple of weeks time. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Hey, Doala. <laughs> hey, Doala. Hey, Doala.